Today, I have the pleasure and the honor of talking to a friend of mine, Matt Mullenwag. Matt is the founder of Automatic. Now, you may not have heard of that name, but that's the parent company for WordPress and a number of other companies we'll have Matt tell us about. WordPress powers roughly 30% of the internet today, and in perspective, at one time, Amazon had about 215 million unique visitors with about 800,000 employees in WordPress had 150 million unique users with only a little over a thousand employees. Matt is uh, both generous and philanthropic uh, with his time and with his money and is one of the early proponents of open source. In a place close to my heart, Matt is also a Texan. Matt, welcome to the show. It's good to have you, my friend. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, it's uh, normally we would do this in person, as you know, um, but considering the pandemic and all that's changed the last few months, I appreciate you uh, doing this distributed, which your company knows something about, and we, we will get to that. Um, but before we kind of go to the distributed workforce and a number of things that WordPress has really been a forefront and a leader in, I want to just give you a chance to tell us a little bit, what is WordPress today in Automatic? So the best way to think about WordPress, as you mentioned, it runs about a third of the websites in the world. Uh, the number two content management system is about one-tenth the size. So WordPress is used for pretty much everything from blogs to full content websites to online stores. Uh, people use it as a backend for app content-driven applications. So you can talk to it purely via APIs and have like a custom JavaScript front end or an app front end. So think of WordPress like a, a content operating system. It's totally open source, so it's all available free. And it's developed, my, my company Automatic contributes to WordPress, but there's also, you know, thousands and thousands of developers all over the world. So it can run sites from very small, like my blog, ma.tt, check it out, to the very large, uh, like uh, the New York Post or the Wall Street Journal is actually about to switch over to be 100% WordPress. So um, I've been working on it since about 2003 now. Interesting. So I, I want to go there for, with you for a second, back to 2003, because WordPress, as we know it today, it's just, it's fundamentally changed how we create and publish content. And I'm just curious, back in 2003, the internet was still young. So walk us through kind of what the internet was like at that time in the environment and what kind of spurred you on to starting this at WordPress? Ah, it was clunky. <laughs> so a lot of websites were hand-coded or custom so every company would kind of build their own CMS or do things, often updating it. You need to be a developer and you need to know HTML and CSS. You would often upload files to a web server. It's just very, a lot of steps in the process. Um, what blogging started to do was say, hey, uh, anyone should be able to write in a box, click a button and have a nice website. And, and there are a lot of predecessors to WordPress, including LiveJournal, Zanga, Blogger, uh, you know, a few others, uh, Radio User Land was one of the originals. But um, with WordPress, what we wanted to say was, okay, let's make it both easy, but also really powerful. So we wanted to make it where anyone could you know, write in a box and click a button, but also they could customize it and really make it their own. And, and how the developer part of it worked was also really easy to understand and accessible, not just the user uh, interface being really accessible. So that's how we got a start. And um, to be honest, at the time, we never really thought about it going for more than blogs. Uh, blogs just seemed like, well, one, it just seemed like what we wanted to do, it was fun. And we didn't really imagine the website, the software expanding to power other things. But, you know, we got really, really good at blogs and people started to say, could I use this for more stuff? Could I have this interface to manage the rest of my website? And so once we got good at that original thing, expanding to these adjacent areas was actually not that hard. And um, and just incrementally over the years, we've been, you know, once we get really good at one thing, adding a bit more on and expanding uh, the capabilities, what we're able to do. You know, it's funny that you said it that way, and maybe not just funny, but it's the same way Coke thinks about expanding our capabilities into other areas. And I was curious, when you, yeah. when you first started this, did you see it as a business? Or you, you, because you mentioned something about this being fun and blogging. Did you see this being a business, or did you see this being like, hey, this is a great way to give back? Kind of, what was the original vision? No, originally not at all. Um, WordPress was then and still is now mostly volunteers, and I was a volunteer as well. Uh, when it started, I just wanted to pay my own salary <laughs> because I thought 
you know, it'd be cool to make money doing this thing that I love. So it was trying to be a business, but with an ambition of maybe like ninety or a hundred thousand dollars per year. Um, over the years, so our ambitions have definitely broadened. So we adopted the mission where we want to democratize publishing and commerce. So we really want to make the tools to have, you know, the most powerful website or store in the world accessible to everyone, regardless of economic ability, language spoken, technical ability, anything. And um, that's really become a a rallying cry of us. And it also feels like a lifelong mission. I don't feel like I'm ever going to be done with this. So I do hope to work on it the rest of my life. And now we think a lot more about modeling automatic the company after like a Berkshire Hathaway or a Coke, where, you know, we want to build something for decades and generations, um, not just this particular go around of technology. How do you, I'm trying to find the right words to ask the question here, because I think that corporations often struggle with the idea of when they say democratizing something or open sourcing something that makes them think like, Hey, I'm just giving away the opportunity to make profits here, but that's not the case. And I'm just curious with, with WordPress, right? You clearly generate revenue. How did you think about this from going from this, Hey, we want everybody to be able to have this tool to, we can generate capital and be self-sustaining and use that as a, um, you know, as an engine for continuing to build you know, economic progress, as well as giving people the tools to succeed in an internet environment. How did you kind of walk through that? Or what was your mental model for thinking through that? Mm. Yeah, we started using that term pretty early. It's, it's kind of over because now people are talking about democratizing ice cream. <laughs> sure, sure. Republishing and commerce are, are really key. And um, when we talk about democratizing, that term for me requires two things, which are freedom and agency. So freedom, open source software like WordPress um, has a license, which is almost like a bill of rights. So it enables certain freedom, certain in inalienable rights to every user and developer on the software. So even if I change my mind tomorrow and want to you know, change how everyone can use software, I literally couldn't because there's this constitution, if you will, to the software. And then agency is the other part of democratizing me where people have full control. You know, a lot of software out there, we all click through those licensing agreements, no one reads them. Okay. <laughs> and we, we sign away a lot of our freedoms when we do so. You, uh, so with open source, you have the freedom to use the software for any purpose, which also means you could sell it if you want to. You have the freedom to see how it works, like opening the hood, uh, you have the freedom to change it and you have the freedom to redistribute those changes. And so when you apply those four freedoms to software, you actually get a world in which um, it's almost like the opposite of the tragedy of the commons, where the more people use something and get involved with it, the better it gets versus like a scarce resource where you would kind of mine uh, something that would get worse the more people used it. So. And software in bits and, you know, you can have these economies of abundance and uh, you get kind of a flywheel effect, much like the Wikipedia, where the Wikipedia wasn't very good when it started. In fact, it was worse than Britannica and Carta and its competitors. But the more people used it, the more people that contributed to it. And eventually that flywheel effect became completely unstoppable, where now we have something that is both free, made by volunteers, and the best repository of human knowledge ever created in the history <laughs> of humanity. So you see this happening in, you know, WordPress is done in the CMS space. You see it happening in database spaces. Linux is doing it for servers. Like there's so much going on that I believe that eventually open source dominates any industry it enters or any problem area it enters. Now, eventually it could take a few years or it could take decades, but I believe the forces that will drive it there are inevitable. Do you think some of those forces are showing up today? I'm just curious of your perspective on all the privacy concerns that are out there. And, you know, we've seen data breaches. We've seen a number of things that would uh, take away from our freedoms, right? Or take away our information or our rights to what we're doing on the internet. And I'm just curious, do you feel that is like, have we already stepped into that? Is that coming? Kind of what's your perspective on where, where we are in that cycle? I think that technology naturally has a pendulum where Sometimes when something new is created, it swings towards being done by one provider or in a centralized fashion, um, a proprietary fashion. Uh, when that concept is proven out, 
generally there's a counter force which says, okay, this works. Why don't we do it in a distributed way? Um, so a good example that's happening right now would be, you know, Slack, Microsoft Teams, like there's a few different tools out there that have really proven the utility of like a company-wide internal real-time communication mechanism for both text and audio and video. And now there's things like matrix.org, which has a company called New Vector behind it, which are creating a completely open source distributed version of that. So now it doesn't matter if Microsoft or Slack goes down, you can keep running your company. And if you're a government, a bank, a large uh, industrial company like yourself that wants to be in control of your agency, when you rely on these tools more and more, you want to say, we want to make sure it's, you know, protected, secure, <laughs> that we can audit the code, that we can change it if we want to and customize it. Adopting that open source solution becomes more and more important. Even if you're going to still run it in the cloud, just being able to modify the code to incorporate your tools better um, can be so empowering and really unlock a lot of productivity and creativity throughout the organization. Now, when you're the size of automatic, but you're the size of y'all, if you can make people five or 10% more effective, that's the equivalent of hiring like 10,000 people, right? So how amazing is that be to use tools to unlock more productivity? You know, it's interesting. And the way you explain that and just the, the, the model and framework you've built for automatic, automatic kind of broke the typical VC model of funding and building and selling a company, right? By either taking it public or letting it be acquired. Because you started this in, in roughly 2003, is that right? Uh, WordPress in 2003, automatic in 2005. Okay. So, but we're 15, 17 years into this, right? And you're still going strong. I was curious, did, was this something that you knew from the beginning that um, we want to stay private? We're going to, you know, we're going to grow and adapt differently. Or is that something that, you know, was part of the evolution over time? I'm definitely not opposed to being a public company at some point. Uh, but we just haven't had a need to for our capital needs or our investors. So... We found that, well, historically, like maybe VCs had like a certain time frame they want things to go public in. One, the market changed, right? You saw companies like Uber get the tens of billions of dollars in market cap while being private. Um, so a lot of that, those investors shifted to the private markets. And, um, you know, they're pretty happy if something's growing 20, 30, 40% a year every single year. <laughs> they want to stay in it. You know, that's, that's better than other things they might put their money in. So they just say, all right, let's uh, let's keep this one rolling. And then also we've been able to have newer investors buy out older investors. So if there was someone who wrote a check in 2005 and they're already up, you know, 500X and they just want to sell, there's someone new coming in that says, okay, this thing is, you know, two or three billion, I could see it going to 10 or 20. You know, they'll buy out the early investor and everyone's happy. So that's, we've been able to use that kind of rolling uh, newer investors buying out older investors to remove where it might be a normal pressure to go public. Yeah. Do you think today's entrepreneurs um, are too narrow-minded about how they're growing their tech companies? Do, they th do you think they should be open to other models versus the typical, we're going to grow it quickly? Or do you think that, um, you know, you or even Coke being a private company, those are, those are more unique, you know, more one-offs? Um. You know, I, it's interesting. In technology, there aren't that many bootstrapped companies that get really large because there is an advantage to kind of growing, investing a little bit ahead of where you're currently at to capture market share because then you can get a flywheel effect, which, you know, the software can kind of dominate its space. Right. I think it would have been more disruptive if we hadn't raised any money, <laughs> but we ended up raising money. So we are kind of traditional in that way. We have shareholders and things. Um, in terms of companies being narrow-minded, I do find there is a lot of um, sort of a cargo cult approach where people build a company because that's how other people have built it and not looking at like why that original person built the company that way. You know, the reason why Google had an office and built these campuses was they were one recruiting people from the other campuses like Sun Microsystems and Microsoft and other companies that people were used to that. Um, and universities, and they had, you know, it was right for that time, the real estate market and the talent market and everything like that. But, you know, I don't believe that if the Google founders were starting today, they would have a campus. They might not even have an office, you know, because if you really look at the forces that are happening in the world, even pre-COVID, 
um, you know, that model was playing itself out. Uh, like uh, at some point you have to look at, okay, there's like more than a trillion dollars of market cap, <laughs> all trying to hire people within this small geographic area around, you know, the San Francisco Bay. Uh, that just is going to lead to <laughs> a level of, of competition and real estate and everything that's going to degrade over time. It's not sustainable. It's, its success will also contain the seeds of its demise. Um, and at the same time, we have, you know, the world getting on broadband, educational opportunities, learning opportunities now being radically open where people are more gated by motivation and internet access than by, you know, being able to get into Harvard or Stanford or one of these uh, formerly like uh, instit institutions which formerly had a monopoly on a great learning. They don't anymore. So when you think of that radical evening out of like access to opportunity of talent, um, intelligence, I believe being evenly distributed in the world, you know, but opportunity not being, if you can tap into that, you have a huge competitive advantage. Um, it's funny because COVID has accelerated distributed and remote work probably by a decade. And in some ways it's been, it's awesome because we've been running this way for 15 years and it's really satisfying to see like so many companies waking up to it. On the other hand, I'm like, oh no, Stripe and Twitter are now hiring people all over the world. That's a lot more competition for me and they make a lot more money than I do. So yeah. it, uh, it kind of shows that like the thing that was our success also contained the seeds of our own demise. Well, so, I mean, you made the perfect bridge there for me. I was just, you know, you've been distributed the, the entire time. Was that, was that part of the vision or was that something that naturally evolved or kind of how that, what, what were the seeds of that originally? So we started there by default because open source is typically volunteers all over the world collaborating online. So we were working together before the company started. And uh, so it made sense to continue that. Now, however, once we started, you know, I met with a lot of the smartest investors in the world and they said, you got to stop that. <laughs> and after the fifth or 10th one, you're like, maybe they're right. And uh, in fact, I wouldn't say I was particularly certain the first few years. Um, it was like, well, you know, we already are doing this. So let's keep this for the next 15, 20 people because it already is working. But in the back of my mind, I thought, well, maybe when we get to 50 or 100, we'll make enough money to fly everyone to San Francisco or move everyone in or something like that. So it was never super certain, but we just kept breaking through all of those barriers, like Dunbar's number, 150 people, 500 people, 1,000 people. And there's been no, uh, there's trade-offs certainly to this your work, but there's been nothing that's held us back from reaching our business goals or, or serving our customers. So for the type of business we're in, an internet business, uh, I do not see a cap to it right now. And in fact, you know, now that we've crossed a thousand, it, it's very easy to imagine being 5,000 or 10,000 in a fully distributed manner because we've built a lot of the systems for communication, for collaboration, for brainstorming, for everything to work together. Yeah. So just to be clear here, because I, I want the people that are listening and, and following along here, when we say distributed, it's not like you have a thousand people around the Houston area, right? I mean, give us a sense of kind of where, I mean, how, how broad this is today and how your company is structured. Yes. So we're now 1,200 people, um, about half in the United States. We're in 46 of the 50 states hmm. and, um, and the other half spread across 75 different countries. So definitely, you know, more in places like Commonwealth countries or places where English is the native language because we still, English is the, the form of communication at Automatic but um, really all over the world. And a lot of countries were just a single person, including like Malta, Maldives, you know, through their people in Haiti, like just kind of everywhere where you wouldn't normally think of like an internet scale tech company being. Um, you know, folks, we just evaluate them based on can they do the work? We don't hire based on where you went to school or even in previous experience. We, uh, we sort of set up ways you can test doing the work, sometimes contributing to open source or answering customer tickets. And uh, people, the best of the best, we we, have, we try to hire. That's really curious. And that's a place I got to stop and, and poke on a little bit here because I would say most enterprises, certainly most corporations, right, um, are still probably not far enough down the path to say, we don't care where you went to school or if you went to school. 
you know, we want to know your GPA, we want to know this. So can you walk through a couple of those core elements of saying, you know, is it that the test that you give them, what other characteristics are you guys looking for? And what's, what's worked and what hasn't worked as you've looked at hiring people remotely over the years? I think, you know, perhaps a principle here is um, don't confuse the map for the territory or, you know, over index on proxy. So previously, I think it made perfect sense to, you know, look at educational background and things like that, because those were excellent proxies for whether someone was going to be able to do the job. Um, good shortcuts. Yeah. Um, well, one, when we started hiring globally, the same schools, like I didn't know the school, the best school in India or, or, or Pakistan or Haiti or something like that. So you just don't have the familiarity to know like what the what the Harvard of, you know, um, Bulgaria is. So uh, we're starting to say, well, what what is the thing that we want? What are they being hired to do? Um, you know, so it's, it's a service person, a customer service. They're being hired to help customers if they're. Uh, a designer, they're being sought, hired to solve user problems using visual tools and language. Developers, the same thing using code. So it's like, okay, well, can we set up a trial project for them that just test that thing, the thing that we're going to pay them to do ultimately? And it's not being in an office, it's not show up in meetings, it's not going to be all these other things that a normal interview process naturally or unnaturally selects for. So, um, our interview process is primarily around this trial project. It actually doesn't, for most roles, doesn't include any voice or video. So we just hire people purely on text. So that means written ability is really important, but I don't really care if someone has an accent or anything like that. Um, you, know, you don't really see them, so it removes a lot of unconscious bias from that process. And um, yeah, so we just type to each other and try to do the work. And that's because automatic runs by mostly typing to each other and trying to do work. Right. Uh, the downside of this process is it does take a little longer. So people have to be motivated to join. And um, and sometimes, like, yeah, the, because it takes longer, sometimes they'll get an offer someplace else while they're still going through our process. But for the people who make it through it, we have extremely high retention, uh, satisfaction, and I feel like we, we get a really good set of folks. We do a lot with... Uh, less people than a lot of other companies. You know, I was doing some reading um, a while back and came across your your blog on the five levels of autonomy. And I thought that was, you know, what Coke were big about mental models and frameworks of just challenging and changing the way we think. And I was wondering if you'd walk us through this, this kind of five levels of autonomy for distributed work and how you've thought about that or maybe how automatics and, and how that's kind of evolved over time. Sure. Um, so yeah, the post, my blog is M8ITT. So I encourage reading the thing. I'll go, but I'll go through it quickly. Yeah. Uh, level zero is, is probably have a lot of these at Coke where a job that can't be done remotely. You know, there's, there's something where like you need to put the widget on the machine or something. So that's never going to be uh, fully remote. Right. Um, level one is probably where most companies were prior to COVID where like, you know, if there was a family emergency or someone had a run to, you know, take their kids to the dentist or something, they could hop on a phone call, they could do something, maybe they could VPN in, but there was no like particular affordances for being remote. But in like an emergency situation, uh, you know, someone could get by for a day or two. Level two is where you say, okay, let's take what we were doing in the office and just start to do it remotely. So this is where you go from being in six hours a day in a conference room to six hours a day on like Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And, and uh, you just try to recreate everything that was in the office, but remotely. Um, this is, is usually the part that sucks for everyone. <laughs> like, you, know, you find that like trying to do the exact same thing doesn't work. And um, but this is just an interim phase, much the way that anytime there's a new media, form of media, you know, it kind of copies the old form. So like, the first things when we had moving pictures or movies, the first things they did was just like point a camera at a stage and they performed a play and that was the movie. <laughs> and it took a while for people to really understand like, oh, we have all these new capabilities. There's cinematography and we can do different angles and have cameras move around and all these different things. You know, but they went through that phase where they just had like a single camera pointed at the stage. And that's level two. Uh, level three is where you start to say, okay, we're all 
on our computers looking at a screen, what does that make better rather than worse? Um, so for example, like maybe we have a meeting, but next to the video, we have our Google Docs and we're taking notes in real time. And, and so everyone can see those notes as they happen. Um, you know, we're uh, utilizing the ability, like we're maybe text chatting a lot more, but then we can always click a button and hop on a phone call. You know, uh, we're maybe setting when we want to be interrupted or not interrupted in a way which is harder in the office, but really nice to do when you're mediated by a computer because you can get really long focus work. Yep. And finally, level four is when you take all that synchronous stuff that you made better and actually make it asynchronous, which I feel like unlocks the most agency and autonomy for, for people. Um, the, that's when you say like, you know, that old joke, like, you know, we're finding out how many meetings could have actually been emails instead. Like, <laughs> One thing I love about being asynchronous is that I think it unlocks the power of introverts, you know, people who might be have like a ton of wisdom and knowledge in their head, but aren't going to be the people who like speak up and jump in in a, in a physical meeting. Um, when you're writing or have the ability to be asynchronous, that gives you time uh, to sort of shine for those people shine. But it also gives like even extroverts time to really consider what they're doing to write and edit and like, you know, think about the problem overnight or in the shower or take a walk around the block or all those things that are the process of just getting better ideas. So you can move less from reaction to more reflection and wisdom. And uh, finally, I have this level five, which is unattainable, call it Nirvana. But that's one like you've gotten so good at everything beforehand that everyone is able to be sort of self-actualized, happy, healthy. They then can incorporate like really great health habits into into their work as well. Um, these are things like, you know, if you take little breaks during the day to exercise, have the food you want, the temperature you want, a candle on your desk, the music you like, like that's when, you know, all this stuff gets really, really fun and you can never imagine returning back to an office. Right. What advice do you have for the companies? And some of these companies are, as you mentioned earlier, going through this in this post COVID world. What advice do you have to help them go from, a, let's say a two to three, right? For that, for that leap and, really you know getting uncomfortable and how do they overcome that you know i think i think you kind of need to go through all the levels until you go through one level you don't appreciate what was wrong about it and what is could be great about the next one so you know if you're in the point now where you feel like you know sometimes they call it zoom fatigue like you've just been back to back video meetings like all day you're, you're worn out like um just have a conversation like be self-aware, raise that as an issue, and have a conversation with their teammates. Like, what should we try differently? Brainstorm five or 10 ideas and then try them for like a week or two and see what worked and what didn't. Like what worked for Automatic isn't going to work for another company. So I never say like do exactly what we're doing. The key is just trying new things and, you know, avoiding those false pro proxies, trying to work from pr first principles of what you're trying to accomplish and then say, even if something's been successful, something we do is like, just try the opposite for like a month and see what happens. And you'll learn a lot from that. And then if you can apply those learnings, you know, you'll figure out for your organization, for your customers, for your teammates and colleagues, what works best for y'all. Um, yeah. One of the things I, I love about you and in what you've built is how you embrace experimentation there. You've, you embrace it with the distributed workforce. You're embracing it with how you're growing your company, with how you're hiring and learning from that, right? That curious and continuous learning process that I believe that's something that Coke has at our core and our core principles as well. But just to continue to be challenged by that is, is fantastic. So I appreciate you sharing that. I was curious, and this often comes up when you're talking about distributed workforces, is how do you build culture? Like what, how do you build a culture and, and there's some good pushback on these, right? I mean, I've played team sports, right? And there is a culture that you get by spending time physically together, breaking bread and hanging out. And so how do you do that? And, you know, what learnings have you had by having this distributed workforce and distributed friends, right? About building that culture that's meaningful and at the, the heart and coal the, the, or the soul of, of WordPress. Yeah. yeah. And it's worth saying here that, we have not in 15 years found a digital equivalent of breaking bread. Actually, there still is that gain together for a meal, which is 
activate something very human in all of us. And so, um, you know, in pre-COVID times, we would have people travel three or four weeks out of the year to get together in person. So that was key for building things. So we're, we're actually in a situation now where, like many other companies, we're like, how do we recreate what we used to do in this three or four weeks of meetups uh, virtually? Um, I think it's it's a good exercise. If you say that culture is really, really important to you, to just go around the room of everyone saying that, and what does that mean to them? Hmm. Yeah, you know? uh, the sharing of a meal is a proxy in some ways. I mean, like you're literally not saying like, we need to get nutrition together <laughs> to survive. <laughs> you're saying something happened at that meal which was really special. And, and uh, how do you recreate that? There's, you know, I tell you some things we found, like we found that it's important to get together uh, for either a call or a video where you're not gonna talk about work. Um, we ask people, we have events where people can bring their kids together, you know, and you know, bring their kids into the Zoom and their kids meet each other and talk. So it's like families meeting each other. Uh, a lot of people play games together. Could be board games, could be esports, could be anything. Um, again, this is optional. We're not forcing people to do it, but giving those opportunities to connect with your colleagues outside of just doing the work together is uh, really, really powerful. And there's actually an incredible intimacy that can come from, you know, this working from home that you wouldn't get in an office. Like uh, you're, you're now, you know, there's all my things behind me. <laughs> you see people's living rooms. You see people's pets and kids come in. You know, if you think what was something we used to do in an office, like I remember my dad worked for uh, Brown River Halliburton. I would look forward to take your kid to work day, you know, where he'd bring me in. That was the coolest thing, you know, yeah. for better or worse, every day is take your kid to work day. Now. <laughs> <laughs> your kids get to see you're setting an example for them and showing them how you interact with colleagues and what you do. And so actually literally bring them in can be a really exciting way. Yeah. So these are just a few ideas. But again, the principle is, again, just trying things. So yeah. if you can identify what was important to you about culture, um, what are other ways that perhaps you could get from A to B without being physically co-located? You know, it's been interesting learning through this uh, this crisis that we've had. You know, I have three kids and a 90-pound golden doodle that could come through this door at any time. But keeping <laughs> us all at home at the same time, to go to your point of what, what have you learned and how have things changed? So as an example, like my 10-year-old daughter because of what I do for a living, she's embraced this idea of like wanting to learn to code. So she's jumped on Khan Academy and learned how to do JavaScript and she's 10, right? Which she, she didn't have time for, right? When she was at school all day and we weren't interacting during the day. Now I've spoken to two or three friends where they said, hey, my daughter and son were helping me learn how to do our, our taxes and pay bills and just understand our family finances. And another one was talking about we're cooking together and we just planted a garden. And, you know, there's all these learnings that maybe we lost when we just went to, we went to work and now we got, we, you know, we've gotten back. I'm just curious in your mind, how much do you think that that's going to stick versus people pulling back and going back to the work model? Yeah, I think there's, there's going to be some pendulum swings mm -hmm. you know, in, in all of this. I think probably we're, we really miss a lot of that in-person connection. We might go back to it too soon. And there could be multiple waves of us having to work from home again. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I could see something like that happening. And the same thing that, you know, working from home right now has a lot of trade-offs. Like normally the past 14 and a half years of me working from home, um, I would go out a lot and see friends and go to lunch with people and like, you know, be part of local volunteer groups or things, things that are, aren't happening right now. So I'm actually really curious as people start to, you know, offices could, I could still be a high risk versus reward, um, especially if you're able to do your work remotely. So if that extends as many tech companies are through the end of the year and possibly even into, you know, halfway through next year, but we're able to connect more with families and local folks because that comes safer, um, that kind of gets you the best of both, where you can have kind of a rich social and human interaction from people you're choosing to interact with um, in your neighborhood or locality, um, but also still get your work done and have a great job, that's, that's a really nice combo. And, you know, I think also that gives people the time to iterate on their home environment in a way that can make it a lot more comfortable. So I totally agree that working from home, if you don't have a good desk, 
a good monitor, a good setup, good internet. It sucks, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, sure. That's terrible. Um, but, and a lot of stuff like good webcams sold out within like the first couple of weeks of this happening. But over the course of the next year, that'll open up again. Much like you can buy toilet paper again, right? Like sure, those sure. initial shortages and spikes will become uh, easier to work around and we'll, we'll ramp up productions, we'll adapt society, we'll adapt manufacturing. So um, I'm actually really curious to see where a lot of companies are at level one or level two right now. When they get to level three and level four, what they choose to rebuild their homes, their commercial real estate, their travel policies, everything um, in, in the future. I mean, even us, a company which is distributed, we were spending $11, $12 million a year on travel, meetups, everything like that. That's gone, <laughs> you know, like the rest of the year, that's that's not happening. Yeah. Um, we're going to, even when things open up again, like we're going to kind of look at how much of that was truly necessary and how much there might be millions of dollars of savings there that we could reinvest in other things. Even if it's just like buying everyone like a really awesome office chair or something for their house. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We, um, one of the practices my family works on, and we don't do this perfectly by any stretch, but you know, we, we believe that, you know, one day of the week you should rest and you should do something, uh, you know, one one day or you know a few days every quarter and then you should have at least you know one full um week off a year and then one of my friends says you should take one year off every seven years and the whole idea is and you can play with the numbers of what's right right but it's this way of um creating space to rethink things right and i think that's interesting in this environment that this one was kind of forced on us that we were all forced to stay at a home we, we couldn't travel but I think it's a, it's been a, while there's a lot of tragic in, in health concerns and other things that I don't want to downplay in any way, shape, or form, it has forced us to stop and be still. And I think in many ways, as productive humans and want people that care about society and one another, that's been a good thing, right? Because it's allowed us to have a conversation like this where we talk about what does that mean to our families and our businesses? and society and how do we not lose that human touch and interaction whether we're in person or at home how can we make those those richer so i really appreciate your your conversations and, and your thought process there one of the things i want to do with you and i didn't warn you of this but you're gonna to have to do it anyways is lightning round of questions i'm gonna ask you seven eight nine ten questions whatever you get All like one sentence or one word just tell me what it is this is a get to know Matt so that they are gonna come in and check you out on your blog and listen to all your podcast stuff so favorite book what's your favorite book oh I'll say um foundation Isaiah Asimov's foundation series which is a little bit of a cheat because it's series but you can read just the first one it's really interesting change how you think nice favorite movie uh, uh, it's an old jazz movie called round midnight uh, set in Paris with uh, Dexter Gordon as the main character. So you're into jazz too. I'm going down a rabbit hole real quick, but is it a lot of the releases of WordPress? Are they around like jazz musicians or something? Every single one since version 1.0 has been named after a jazz musician. So we've, we've highlighted 40 or 50 jazz musicians now. That's awesome. <laughs> Favorite thing for you to do in your free time? Uh, read. I really love reading. To me, that's a perfect vacation if I can just read. Yeah, I, I could go with you on that. Favorite superhero? Ooh, um, you know, growing up, I really loved the Green Lantern. Really? I just the idea that like you can create things with your mind, and um, yeah, actually, I think that's part of you know maybe one of the things I loved about software is you create things with your mind. Yeah. Good answer. Most underrated city in the U.S. Oh, I say Houston. <laughs> I'm sure there's some other good ones, but uh, yeah, I, I really love Houston. That's awesome. If you could fix any one industry tomorrow, what, which one would it be? Uh, fix? Well, I don't know how to fix it, but you know, if you think of just helping humanity, it would be healthcare. You know, nothing else. It, it shows that like, if you're not healthy, nothing else matters. Work doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Anything. So, that kind of baseline, I would love to be available to every human. Yeah, that's right. What would people? Um, most be would most people be shocked to learn about you a lot of people are shocked that i'm i live in houston everyone thinks i'm in san francisco <laughs> uh, 
I guess I seem like San Francisco guy. I go to Burning Man and stuff, but I still am in Houston. Um, but shocked? Um, hmm. I don't know. I'm pretty open. So I blog a lot of things that I do. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll just say the Houston. <laughs> so I often ask people this too. If you could have like one other gift that you don't have, like so you could sing, you know, you could write, you could be an excellent orator. If you could have one other talent that you don't have, which talent would it be? I only uh, speak English. I'd love to be able to speak the polyglot and speak other languages. Yeah, that would be great. I wish we would have learned more of that stuff in school or at least uh, given me a baseline for that. I agree. Um, so I love doing, going through this lightning round with you just so people kind of get to know you a little bit more. But I want to, you know, I know we don't have a whole lot of time left, but what I do want to kind of end um, and kind of put our last set of questions against is, you know, at Coke, our viewpoint is that businesses exist to create value in society, right? And there's a lot of debate in tech circles about how we should measure success and you know is it more important to grow or more important to create something that's of a value i was just i was just curious you know how do you um as you see this and i know you were one of the early big proponents of open source um software and how you think how do you think about your time and the time of your company in terms of about generosity and, and philanthropic activities and giving back to society yeah it's easier if you start it from the beginning so I'm, I'm probably more of the school. I think there's, there's a, a smart argument to be made for like make as much as possible and then kind of like give it away at the end and you have more resources and compound until. Um, and a lot of people I admire, like Warren Buffett have, and Bill Gates have done that. So uh, I have tried to sort of give it away as we go. And, and also in setting up the business, I like to try to set up automatic in a benevolent way, but in a way that if it did not have a benevolent leader, if there were just pure self-interest, economic self-interest, that it would still do the right thing by the community. So we've tried to set up Automatic as an ecosystem company, meaning that for every dollar that we make, there's about $20 made in the WordPress ecosystem. So we're only about four or 5% of, of the revenue in the WordPress ecosystem, um, which I estimate to be probably like somewhere between eight or $10 billion a year now um, going through it. So, so when you build that successfully, you have to be careful because you can't, if you take the oxygen out of the room by capturing too much of it, the ecosystem kind of withers and dies. Um, but of course, if you don't make enough, your business isn't sustainable. And that kind of like uh, the leverage point that you have for contributing and leading the way and leading by example um, becomes a counter example. You know, a lot of people want automatic with starting. We're like, Oh, this is going to be like a Craigslist or other sort of shorthands for a company that should have had, you know, all the opportunity in the world and, and it slipped through its hands. So that's part of why it's always been important for me to be successful and sustainable as well as espouse these principles. Because if I'm out there saying how distributed work and open source and everything is great, and then my company craters, <laughs> it's going to set the field back 10 years because everyone's going to look like, oh, look, look at that guy. He was out there saying how fantastic this stuff is and didn't build a business that could stay in business. So, right. you know, that is the baseline, um, at least in our current capitalist framework. And so, um, yeah, try to do good and do well. Yeah. So what is, and I saw this on the website and don't have to quote it word for word, but I was just curious because I saw it on the automatic site. What's the automatic creed and why is that up on your, on your website? Oh, yeah. So if you go to automatic, A-U-T-O-M-A-T-T-I-C dot com slash creed, spells it out. Um, this is a document that is written in first person. I will always be learning. I will never pass up an opportunity to help a colleague. Um, I'll remember the time before I knew everything. Like just a few words written in first person that um, we actually put um, on the offer letter. So when you sign your name to join automatic as company, you're actually signing your name right next to this creed. And uh, we've tried to incorporate things that are pretty timeless. Uh, so it's um, even though the business that we're in changes dramatically uh, over the years, uh, this, this creed has actually remained fairly uh, durable. And, and, um, and so that's just something that, that we hold to. We use it a lot in like evaluations. So we, we talk about the creed and how people are doing. 
Um, I would end up referring to it a lot and um, and kind of town halls and things I'm doing. And it's nice to have this kind of keystone document that we can return to of things that feel timeless and also some things that are not everyone would agree with. You know, I like values that are controversial or like smart people would say, I, I don't agree with that. Um, so we, we try to put some things that are a little provocative in there as well. And um, I'm curious to see how it evolves in the decades to come as a, as we go from 1,000 to 5,000 or 10,000. I'm very curious to see how that's going to evolve. I'm actually thinking about a revision to it right now uh, to add uh, essentially like something around assuming positive intent in your colleagues and, and being as thoughtful as possible in what you um, in what you say and how you act, being impeccable with your word. There's not something around that in the creed right now. And it feels particularly as we evolve um, to get bigger, something like that could be really useful in there. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's great. I, I encourage everyone that's going to be listening and watching this to go to your website and check this out. Um, embrace this for themselves, too. I mean, we have something at our own household that we have as part of our own kind of Ilian family creed. Um, and, and, cool. I think, and I think it's great that you are, you're embracing this. It, it Coke, we often talk about this, and it's the title of Charles's last book, right? It's this good profit, meaning, you know, can we be economically successful in such a way that we're doing it to benefit society and others, right? And what is that? Not just the what, but the why. And that's what I loved about that creed is like, there's this why behind it, that it's, you know, back to the, the quote, without vision, the people suffer, the people perish. And this helps them give them the vision. So kudos to you. And Matt, Matt thank you for taking time to come hang out with us today. We appreciate all your insights and uh, I look forward to seeing Wichita again soon. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. See you.